We have not met in a while, and I will take the blame for that as chairman of the commission. Uh, we've not met for a while uh, because I have been negligent in calling a meeting, but also there's really not been a lot of news to report until recently. Uh, we wanted to take, uh, um, have this meeting today to get everybody caught up, not just uh, those of us on the commission, not just those who have a specific interest in Asian carp, but the members of the public and the citizens of the state of Tennessee. Also, I forgot to mention before we get started, I wanted to be sure and welcome Representative Monty Fritz. Representative Fritz, thank you for being here. I was just telling uh, Mr. Butler beside me that uh, Chairman Todd announced this in the meeting yesterday and was happy to see at least one person show up. And Representative Fritz is very uh, concerned about this issue. I know uh, he, he uh, represents Roan and Loudoun County, is that correct? Roan and Loudoun County, and, uh, which has got the Tennessee River running right through the middle of it. And it's a big concern to him as constituents, and we appreciate you being here uh, today. Thank you. We also wanted to point out, we've got uh, the, the Executive Director of the Tennessee Wildlife Resource Agency, Mr. Jason Maxidon, and the Deputy Director, uh, Brandon Ware, with us as well. So again, thank you for everybody being here today. We do have an agenda, and uh, that, that was published on our, on our website <clears throat> at the announcement for this meeting, so we'll just get started with the agenda, unless there's any announcements or introductions that any of the committee members would like to make before we get started. Seeing none, we'll get started with the agenda. Up first is Mr. Mark Thurman with Tennessee Wildlife Resource Agency, Chief of Fisheries. So, Mr. Thurman, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to come here and talk to you today. Uh, we have two of our fisheries division staff uh, here to give you presentations. Cole Hardy, our aquatic invasive species coordinator, will be giving you updates on funding, carp distribution, um, talk about monitoring efforts and prevention and control. Um, then we'll have Eric Gaines, our commercial fishing coordinator. He'll be giving you a presentation on our Tennessee Carp Harvest Incentive Program. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Cole. All right. Good afternoon, Commission, and uh, thank you for having me here today to provide this update. I'm going to be covering uh, several different items, including an overview of the funding and how federal funds make it to TWA for invasive carp projects. I'm going to highlight the ongoing projects uh, and management actions that we have going, and also describe the distribution and status of carp throughout the Tennessee and Cumberland Rivers. Oh, if I would, if I could just interrupt you quickly. Yep. Just for the members of the commission, uh, we, we encourage, I encourage you to ask questions, but if you would, let's allow Mr. Hardy to finish his presentation. If you have a question, uh, if a question comes to you while he's making this presentation, just write it down, and when he gets through with this presentation, we'll take some time to see if any of the members of the commission have any questions. All right, Mr. Hardy, thank you. Um, and then I'm also going to uh, be describing some of the tools that we have as fisheries managers to prevent uh, and control carp uh, and the strategy that TWA and partners are supporting uh, in the effort. So I wanted to start here uh, with the federal funding for carp management. Uh, the management and control plan for invasive carp was developed in 2007. It contains goals, objectives, and strategies for carp management and is often referred to as the National Plan. Since 2015, Congress has appropriated funding to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service with the purpose of implementing the National Plan. A portion of these funds shown on, on the graph here um, are retained by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and used as what they refer to as invasive carp base funds. Um, it's worth noting that in uh, FY20, that's federal fiscal year 2020, um, there was a, a significant increase in the funding for uh, the implementation of this plan, up from uh, $11 million the year before up to $25 million, uh, and that has held steady. Uh, and then we've just recently seen an increase for fiscal year 23 up to $31 million. Um, most of this funding, uh, however, has been made available to states. I mentioned uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service keeps a portion, but the majority of those funds are made available to, to states throughout the Mississippi River Basin uh, to, through grants to implement invasive carp projects. Now, I also want to take a moment to just stop and highlight that um, 
these these funds are specifically for CARP projects implementing this plan. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about deterrence later on, uh, and any deterrent funding would come from a different place. It's not associated with this uh, funding. So as I mentioned, the majority of the Fish and Wildlife Service funding uh, is made available to the states in the Mississippi River Basin. The Mississippi River Basin consists of six sub-basins that represent uh, partnerships in each of these sub-basins uh, that include federal entities uh, and, and state partners. Uh, those federal and state partners work collaboratively to develop and agree upon uh, projects and funding priorities. Projects developed by the partnerships are also reviewed by MICRA, the Mississippi Interstate Cooperative Resource Association, and then finally approved by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service leadership. And all this just to say that there's a significant amount of partnership. You'll hear that as a, a constant throughout my presentation here. Um, but there's a lot of partnership and collaboration that goes on with uh, state and federal entities and experts throughout the country. So what does all this mean for TWA? Initially, when funding became available, uh, we worked with partners like Tennessee Tech um, to learn more about how to sample, uh, how to capture carp, because it was relatively new to us um, targeting these species in our reservoirs. Um, and as more funding has become available, we've been able to actually increase the amount of carp projects that we've been able to do. Uh, including adding dedicated staff uh, to address this issue. We've also been able to establish and fund our harvest incentive program, uh, which will also be discussed more later on. Um, I'm going to go through some of the ongoing and active projects that we have right now and kind of talk about how they've helped us gain more knowledge about the carp population that we have in our systems. To start with, uh, we began larval sampling uh, looking for uh, small juvenile larval fish uh, in 2016. Uh, we're looking specifically for invasive carp uh, in, in Kentucky and Barkley Reservoirs. Uh, thankfully, uh, there's a, a lot of effort that gets put on the ground as a part of that project specifically for that. Um, you know, larval fish trawls, we're doing light traps, we're doing uh, mini fike nets. Um, hours and hours and hours throughout the throughout the majority of the summer from April through about the end of August and thankfully we haven't seen any evidence of successful um, spawning. Uh, it's worth noting that there was a significant spawn somewhere uh, within the basin within the Mississippi River Basin as a whole in 2015 uh, and that's when we saw a, a significant explosion of, of young carp and those carp that could have been um, in the Tennessee and Cumberland rivers, we don't know for sure whether it was or not, uh, but it was really uh, pretty ubiquitous throughout the Mississippi River Basin in that year. Uh, so those also could be uh, fish that have come up from the Ohio River into our systems. Uh, we've also been conducting some uh, surveillance in the upper Tennessee River. Uh, that began in 2020. We've been electrofishing uh, below the five uh, dams over in that region, Nickajack, Chickamauga, Watts Bar, Fort Loudon and Melton Hill. Um, that's been numerous hours of electrofishing uh, each year uh, from about April through September, uh, and we have had no silver carp detections. Uh, and then I want to add to to both of these efforts. While these are targeted efforts, I'm talking about specifically for invasive carp. There's a whole lot of other stuff that we have going on as an agency out there for. Um, you know, spring bass sampling and community sampling in the in the fall, trap netting in the fall. We've got creel surveys on reservoirs that, uh, you know, we've got people being out interviewing anglers um, multiple times, multiple days per week. Uh, we've got a commercial fishery on many of these reservoirs that we're, we're monitoring as well. Um, and then, you know, the, the public. Um, there's tens of thousands of hours of of time spent on these reservoirs on these waters by boaters and anglers uh, and so you know we have not had um, any evidence come through from any of those efforts of a successful spawn uh, on Kentucky or Barkley Lakes or in our systems um, and we've also not had any 
um, reports further in in East Tennessee and the, below those um, reservoirs where we've been monitoring. So uh, we've also been conducting some uh, just general population modeling for carp or monitoring. Excuse me. Um, you know, it's helping us get a better understanding of where where these fish are, where they're how they're distributed through the Tennessee and Cumberland River. Um, we're looking at size and age structure of these populations uh, to help us inform our, our um, management options. Uh, and we're continually refining our sampling methods as we learn more about them and, and better ways to collect them and sample them. We also work with partners like the USGS and Tennessee Tech to track the movement of these fish using telemetry, uh, looking for things such as environmental cues that might trigger movement and evaluating these fish and how they interact with our locks and dams uh, to either make upstream or downstream passage. We're currently entering a structured decision-making process with state and federal partners uh, in the Tennessee and Cumberland River subbasin. And we plan to provide the results of this uh, structured decision-making process, which will prioritize locations uh, for where we would like to see deterrence placed uh, to the Army Corps of Engineers as they proceed with their uh, pilot program for um, control of CARP. And finally, we've been able to implement a successful CARP harvest incentive program, working with wholesale fish dealers and commercial fishers to remove millions of pounds of CARP from our affected waters. So it's those projects that allow us to lay out and describe the population of silver carp in the Tennessee and Cumberland rivers as we currently know them. This understanding of carp populations contributes to the strategies that we support to prevent their advancement upstream and control them where they are. So I've just got a, a map on the screen here that's describing the distribution of carp. Um, over on the western part of the state is the Mississippi River and it's in a dark maroon color. Um, and that represents a high abundance of carp and relatively consistent reproduction, almost annual reproduction of some sort out in that river system. Um, moving into Kentucky and Barkley Lakes, both the Tennessee and Cumberland River, uh, we also call those high abundance uh, populations of carp there. Um, but the reproduction, again, is, is undocumented at this point or inconsistent at, I guess, worst is what you would say. Um, but Moving upstream within each of those river systems, you get to Cheatham and Pickwick reservoirs where we've got moderate abundance uh, and unlikely reproduction. Uh, and then I've got uh, Old Hickory Reservoir on the Cumberland River here showing as a low abundance where we've, we've collected a, a few carp and actually they were collected in Old Hickory as early as 2008. Uh, and yet today we, we see a population there that's very low you know, generally not causing an issue. People hardly even encounter them on Old Hickory, um, but they are there. Uh, and then there's uh, several red X's um, moving upstream in the Tennessee River beyond Wilson Dam. And those X's represent just isolated individuals that have been uh, either reported or documented or, or captured at one point or another. And uh, in total, that's less than 10 fish combined with all of those um, X's through that stretch of the river. So knowing the distribution and status of these populations, we're working to put the best uh, possible control strategies into place. The two primary tools that we have as fisheries managers to prevent and control carp are deterrence and removal. Deterrents are an important component of carp control that we're working towards with partners. The premise behind deterrents is that they'll prevent or deter carp from migrating upstream, reducing the numbers, entering, and progressing through our systems. The technology comes with a multi-million dollar price tag, making it critical for available resources to be used in a targeted method. If funded, deterrents would be placed at locks and dams owned and operated by partner agencies like the Corps, of engineers or uh, Tennessee Valley Authority. The plan supported by TWA and national uh, experts, excuse me, national partners would place the first deterrence at Wilson Lock, 
which is at the leading edge of carp populations, and at Kentucky Lock, uh, above the primary source of carp in the Ohio River. It's also critical that while we work towards deterrence, uh, that we continue to harvest carp where they are, focusing effort on Kentucky and Barkley reservoirs, Decreasing the carp in the system also reduces likelihood that they will move upstream. It will also be important to con continue removal efforts once deterrents are in place, completing a sort of block and tackle sort of strategy that uh, we've referred to it before, you know, blocking carp from coming into our system at, at, from the source at the Ohio River, blocking them from going upstream uh, with our deterrent at at Wilson as it's currently prioritized, and then fishing them down within the system where they're already at. And so a few uh, just things to point out in summary here, kind of highlights, is that federal funding has played a key role in advancing our knowledge about carp populations. There's been no evidence of a successful spawn since we began larval monitoring in 2016, also suggesting that our populations are largely a result of migration and the remaining 2015 year class. There's been no significant upstream population advancement. These fish are not exhibiting a salmon-like run, you know, trying to get as far upstream as they possibly can, as quick as they can. Um, and we also, we need to implement deterrence strategically as funding allows and uh, in, in the best, best approach to, to knock these populations down, down where they're at. And we also need to continue our removal efforts throughout the process. And that's all, right. all I've got. I'll take well, questions, Mr. Let's, Chairman. Well, let's pause here for a minute and see if any of the committee members have any questions. Any questions from any committee members? Yes, uh, Cole, <clears throat> Paul DC with Tennessee Valley Authority. You had mentioned uh, fish and wildlife. I don't think anyone from fish and wildlife is here, here today. Um, do they have any specific programs going on this year in 2023? Uh, if you're aware of them, if not, that that's that's fine. Um, specific programs in 2023. Yeah, how they're addressing carp, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. So um, they're they're continuing to receive funding and implement that national plan. Um, I guess that's as far as implementing a program. That's they're keeping on track with with that process. That's what I would say. I know they're all part of the micro group, but I think it might be good, Mr. Chairman, at the next meeting probably we have U.S. Fish and Wildlife here to give us an update of what they're doing. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman. But Mr. Butler, you recognize can I uh, yes. Can I add to that? Yes. Um, uh, we do keep in touch pretty regularly with, with the Fish and Wildlife Service and, and um, communicate about several different processes with them. And, um, you know, I was, we were hopeful that we'd get a, an update on the bioacoustic fish fence prior to the meeting, um, but they needed just a little more time to work things out, and we are expecting an update from them in about the next month or so. Um, to That's just, probably the answer I'm looking for. Yep. Is that, uh, <laughs> yep. Fish fence. Okay. Because we haven't heard from them in a while with that. Okay. All right. Mr. Butler, you recognized. Cole, excellent presentation. I'm... Um, I'm biased, but I think that y'all are uh, several steps ahead of all the surrounding states around us. You're doing great work. One question I did have is that we've seen some things on the on the wire recently about a black carp um, uh, bounty program, and I believe it's being run out of Illinois. Can you shed a little light on that? And, and it sound I, we think we heard that it was refunded. And the reason I bring that up is that black carp primarily uh, feed on mussels. And they are, we, have, we know they're in the Duck River, and we know the Duck River is home to some really you know, important globally endangered mussels. And so I'm kind of want to get an update on that from you. Yeah, so black carp are a, a pretty significant concern for us. Uh, thankfully, we have not seen any black carp collected here uh, re in the recent years. Um, Eric, do you remember when the last, was that 2019 that we had some documented in Big Sandy area of Kentucky Lake and also in Barkley. Um, the, the majority of the black carp that we see are showing up on the Mississippi River uh, in commercial tackle. Um, I, I believe those few that have been documented in Kentucky and Barkley were in commercial tackle as well. 
um, and our commercial commercial fishermen know about them and are, are keeping an eye out. But um, to your point about the bounty program, it, it has been renewed um, through the state of Illinois. I think they work with uh, maybe SIU on that program. Um, and I'm the point of contact. Uh, so if an angler or a commercial fisherman were to uh, collect a black carp in our waters, uh, We'd prefer that they contact us so that we can take the metrics that we need from that fish, the biological data from that fish, um, share that with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the USGS, um, and then they can apply for that uh, hundred dollar reward yeah, per fish. Yeah, I think it's a hundred dollars per fish. Yes. Is... Yep, Mr. Tomlin, you're recognized. Thank you for the report, Cole. Uh, <clears throat> excellent job. Uh, one question. Um, last year, we helped bring in the Bassmaster Elite Series to Pickwick Lake, Pickwick Landing State Park, and I know that's a tricky situation with Mississippi right there and Alabama right there. Um, it's, the, the anglers reported seeing quite a few carp on Pickwick. Um, can you elaborate maybe what's happening? I, I'm very aware of what Kentucky Lake is doing, but is there any plans to expand buying stations or talk a little bit about Pickwick and, and working across state lines? I don't want to steal Eric's thunder too much. He's got more uh, more T-chip talk coming up here. But Pickwick has been. Uh, we've expanded the program to include Pickwick. Um, and so I think he's been working hard at trying to find uh, other potential buyers in that area. I think that might be something that's lacking there. Um, and, and trying to get people interested in fishing it. Um, so... We, we do work out there as an agency, uh, and we partner with Alabama and Mississippi in those efforts, uh, trying to tag fish and, and you know, keep, keep an idea of how fish are using Pickwick Lock um, to move up and downstream. So we've, we've seen them out there, we've collected them, and, and they tend to be big fish, uh, but they fit right in with all that rest of it, no spawning, anything like that. So. Okay. Any further questions? Seeing them before we go to you, I've got a couple of questions. Um, going back to the $25 million that uh, has been appropriated the last several years, what, and I know that's appropriated uh, to be used across the, the basin, I guess, for what, four states or more than that? So that $25 million, it's now up to $31 million right. uh, for fis federal fiscal year 23. Um, that's an in <clears throat> Department of Interior like, appropriation to Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, Fish and Wildlife Service keeps a portion of those funds for their own work, um, and then a majority of those funds go out to the states. Ma they're made available to the states. So how much have we been getting the last several years from the $25 million? The The last several years, we've been um, right around the $2 million mark, plus or minus a few hundred thousand. And specifically that $2 million, what's it being spent on? Uh, the majority of that... Uh, money that we get Fish and Wildlife Service grants for, it goes to our T-CHIP program. Okay. Um, it's also used for the, the projects that we're putting on the ground, our staff, um, and uh, some research activities through Tennessee Tech. Okay. And with it being increased to 31 million, if we've been getting 2 million, uh, we, we may, we could probably expect to get a little bit more than to go toward these programs we've been spending money on them. Is that correct? Um, that's going to be up to the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, first and foremost to determine how they plan to, um, you know, d divvy up, for lack of a better way of saying it, that money, how much they, they will retain for their own use and uh, how it will be distributed throughout the sub-basins. Um, I would speculate a little bit uh, just because we've been involved in multiple sub-basins. Um, we primarily work in the Tennessee Cumberland that I had on the screen, but we also work in the lower Mississippi River. And uh, when that initial funding kind of bumped up from $11 million to $25 million, it brought several other sub-basins kind of on board to okay. start working on carp. <clears throat> so I would suspect that uh, they may f sort of favor uh, approaching a more full uh, level of funding for some of those other sub basins, uh, but certainly wouldn't discount that we would we would be able to request additional funds. And then over the last several years, uh, how much state money or, or state um, our money? How much from TWA has been putting into the uh, CARP buying program, the T-chip program? Um, so, really, the 
vast majority of what we're doing right now is federally funded. There okay. are a couple of, uh, of grants. Um, 2021, I think it was, we approved a $400,000 grant for the commercial industry. And that, um, Eric's going to talk more about that. I, I won't, again, I don't want to steal his thunder too much, but, um, you know, initially when our teach it program started, it was largely state funded. Right. And we've been able to shift that to using these federal funds that we apply for it with that increase. Okay. Um, last thing, I just want to, I just want to restate this because it's something you and I've talked about numerous times you you mentioned and just for the public to know again we have not seen a successful spawn any evidence of a successful spawn since 2015 and and we we believe and we believe the science backs up that the that the vast majority if not all the carp that we're seeing are migrating into the lakes is that correct that's correct all right thank you mark i'll go back to you and you can introduce I, oh i'm sorry i'm sorry uh, Chairman Box, you recognized. Cole, thank you so much for the detailed presentation. I just want to go back to what um, Mike was referring to on the funds from U.S. Federal Fish and Wildlife. I think you said everything, as far as our program with Tennessee Tech and commercial fishermen, that deterrents are not covered in that funding. Uh, correct. So, okay. um, yeah, that covers the implementation of that plan, the projects uh, that we're looking at now. It, it would not be able to be used as a non-federal match component um, that will be likely be necessary to implement uh, deterrent. Um, there has been some money appropriated uh, as a part of WERDA Section 509. Um, it's, uh, it's been authorized but not yet appropriated at $25 million. Um, and so we're, again, working with, working with partners and uh, trying to prepare for it when and if that money is ultimately appropriated. All right, great. Thank you so much. In, in other Chairman. words, Congress said this would be a good idea, but no, nah, we're not going to give you the money to do it. That's basically what they said. All right. All right. Mr. Thurman, you're recognized. Thank you. Our next presentation will be from Eric Gaines, our commercial fishing coordinator, and he'll be talking about our Tennessee carp Harvest Incentive Program, a program that uh, we consider very successful, and and uh, Eric's been managing that. And so, Eric, I'm going to turn it over to you. And I know Mr. Thurman said your name, but if you would restate your name for the record and, and your position with the agency. Uh, hello, um, my name is Eric Gaines. I'm the Commercial Fishing Coordinator for the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency. And I'll be giving a brief update on our Tennessee Carp Harvest Incentive Program. That's not that works so well for me. <laughs> there we go. Um, I would just like to state our, our Tennessee resident wholesale fish dealers and our commercial fishermen are a valuable part of our Tennessee economy. Our fishing industry provides uh, fresh fish for local communities, provides retail outlets with fresh and frozen fish, uh, provides jobs. Uh, supports the well and supports the well-being of our commercial and support fishery. Uh, the beginning of the T chip program uh, started in 2008, 2018 September, where we enrolled two vendors in that program. At that time, uh, both of those vendors were from Henry County. Uh, one was Hearts Fish Market, and the other was um, North American Caviar. Uh, we did add a third vendor. Uh, in the spring of 2019. Uh, they were from Camden. That was D&D &D Fish Caviar. Uh, so we were, were really excited uh, to be able to, to spin up as quickly as we did. Um, and through those efforts, the, um, the wholesale fish dealers immediately onboarded our 14 commercial fishermen during that time, uh, which was we were pretty excited about. Uh, that was really a good group of fishermen that we worked with and that we knew um, intimately, like I said, I work with a lot of the commercial fishermen, so I had an in-depth knowledge of those individuals, and, and I knew that they would be a valuable resource for the program. Uh, we've since uh, grown to 22 fishermen in the program, so we've increased a little bit, but we've also increased the capacity through their knowledge of being able to harvest fish in the program and being very, very instrumental in, in that throughout uh, the reservoirs that are currently available for uh, commercial carp harvest. Um, part of the, the work 
that we did with uh, the T-chip vendors were we had available funding uh, and a small grant in 2018. Uh, that grant was allowed or allowed us to provide those businesses with the much needed uh, equipment that they needed. I think it was uh, um, ice machines and, and totes at that time. And, uh, but we also followed that up in 2019 with an additional funds. Uh, those funds were passed through the local governments in Henry and uh, Benton County. And uh, they allowed uh, us to assist those businesses uh, to purchase um, capacity building, um, uh, really capacity building things that we hadn't necessarily accounted for, which were freezers uh, for those businesses. They needed to be able to hold fish and needed to be able to have those fish on hand when they were wanting to sell those fish to whomever wanted to purchase those. Uh, they also had to um, have forklifts. Like I say, when you're unloading these boats that are coming in at a, at a fast pace, you need to be able to get those into your business and out of your business taken care of and, of course, be ready for the next person coming in. Uh, totes are an important part of that uh, business where you may have totes that are... Uh, insulated or non-insulated depending on the season so uh, in our beginnings we didn't quite understand that but the businesses quickly made us aware that those were much needed items uh, so we were glad to be able to provide those to them and also scales to be able to measure the, or weigh those fish again the valuable part of, of that item is uh, its accountability uh, in our program where they will have those fish coming off of uh, their boats uh, or out of their trucks They'll sort those fish out. They'll weigh those fish. They'll have a ticket for those, and then they'll be able to uh, put that down on their wholesale fish dealer forms, and the commercial fishermen will be able to get those on their commercial fishing report forms. Those, that's the accountability portion of the T-CHIP program because we'll have to come back whenever they submit those invoices, and I'll have to approve those and make sure that those funds are, are where they should be going at that time. We also were able to provide uh, the commercial fishermen uh, with some needed assistance on the, in that same timeline in 2018 and 19. We purchased commercial gill nets, uh, ropes, and buoys. At that time, the commercial fishermen were not adept at fishing for carp. They mainly, mainly fished for their buffalo, catfish. So that new gear changeover was something that was new for them. And we knew that we needed to swiftly be able to provide them with a needed capacity um, with that, with those nets to be able to fish and get spun up to the program very quickly. So we were glad to be able to provide those two years uh, to the fishermen. Um, and also with that, they were able to, to place orders for new netting because sometimes those nettings take nine to 12 months to come in. So we knew that ahead of time. So we wanted to make sure that we could buoy them be getting into the program and then be able to capacity build beyond that. Um, our program um, runs out of two river systems, of course, the Cumberland and Tennessee River. Uh, mainly, most of our harvest comes out of Barclay and Kentucky Lake, but on the Cumberland system, they can harvest out of Barclay, Cheatham, and Old Hickory. Uh, again, the majority of that harvest does come from Barclay Reservoir. Um, they can also harvest off Tennessee River with the majority of the harvest coming from the Kentucky Reservoir. Um, we recently added Pickwick Lake uh, to the T-CHIP program uh, last year uh, in hopes to be able to have a new person stepping into that program there. Um, I've been working with our vendors that we currently have, and they're going to be going to that, that location, Pickwick, hopefully in the coming weeks to be able to see what they can take out of that reservoir and then be able to see what, what they need to do to be able to go down there and harvest on a regular basis. Our T-CHIP program has grown since uh, fiscal year 2019, where at first we had 1.2 million pounds harvested. Like I say, we thought that was great uh, in, in first implementing that program. Uh, our commercial fishermen and our wholesale fish dealers have a vast amount of experience, so that, that really showed quickly. Uh, but since that point, last uh, several years, and up to uh, FY22, we've grown to 7.6 million pounds through the program. Uh, it's quite astonishing for me. 
uh, that group of people uh, are some of the hardest working people that we see out there, and and we really appreciate their efforts, and also the the wholesale fish dealers by uh, being able to purchase those fish to them from them and getting them back out on the water uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, so, with the coming uh, years, we hope to um, of course sustain the level of harvest that we have, and hopefully that will. Uh, less than the amount of carp that we have in the program or in the system itself. And then hopefully with what Cole was talking about with the deterrence, that that will lessen the impact overall with carp in the state. So with that, uh, I'll be glad to take any questions. All right. Are there any questions? Mr. Butler, you recognized. Eric, um, it's really exciting to see how fast that program has grown. One thing that's been uh, of particular interest to a lot of our uh, supporters is bycatch and I've been really surprised at how little bycatch that I've witnessed personally the times I've watched the process take place can you speak a little bit about that on a broader level because I think that's a really important point about how efficient these guys are at pulling out the target species I can with with a lot of um, individuals that may not be necessarily familiar with uh, gill netting uh, the commercial fishermen have to go out they have to set these nets and they have to go back and retrieve those Having anything else in there is only going to take up more time out of their day. So with, with of course, the advent of the sonars that they have now, they target those fish very well, and they will actually only set their gear over those fish. So they, in those big groups of fish, you don't see a lot of other fish associating with those. So they're trying to stay out of them, you know, the shallow water areas. The other areas that our sport fishermen are, are in at the, at the present time, and they do encounter those, and they, they work very well around those individuals. Um, and like I say, they, they target those. In fact, several years ago, um, a group of fishermen came back and said, look, we would like to be able to use a larger gill net to be able to circle those fish so we're not dead setting a gill net and having any more, ampl any more bycatch on those fish. So we were quickly uh, able to pass that. And that tool really allowed the commercial fishermen to start harvesting more carp because it was very focused effort, and bycatch was 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 not nil, but it was pretty close. They they don't I really just, catch a I lot did, of. I fish. just wanted to give you a chance to kind of expand on that because that it's really important, and I think it's it's one of the reasons why we're seeing sports fishermen be excited to support this effort, and we want to continue to build on that. Any further questions? You recognized. Yeah, just a quick way. A lot of good information here, Eric. Um, it looks like you've re, uh, the commercial fishermen have removed a lot of carp from the lake, so well done there. Um, is it easy for them? There's not a lot of red tape, not a lot of bureaucracy for them to go through to be able to be commercial fishermen. Is it, has TWR already made it an easy process? Um, I wouldn't necessarily. That that's not necessarily what we do. There there is a high hurdle sometimes with entering into the commercial fishing industry. I know equipment, trucks, gear can be quite costly. Um, but the, a few of the commercial fishermen are trying to get into the program with partnering with our with our uh, with our cheat chip vendors and and kind of gently rolling into the program with whatever funds that they have that they make they'll quickly turn that over and buy a new boat. So they're, they're slowly gearing into the program where it's not such a, a burden as a one-time purchase. So. Thank you. Mr. Tomlin, you're recognized. Yeah, thanks for that report, Eric. One quick question. I noticed as harvest is increasing, do you see funding being an issue? It looked like on your graph, you were getting close to that 2 million annually on your payout. Do you have budgets looking forward as you bring on Pickwick and other reservoirs um, talk, talk about your funding and have you planned for the growth? And as you answer that question, because I was going to ask something similar, I, I think you said there was, what, 7.6 or 7.8 million pounds how, last year. How many of those pounds were subsidized and how many were not? And I guess to a commercial fisherman, I know we've got one here, but uh, can the commercial fisherman make it without subsidization? At what point is the harvest going to exceed the money and uh, and do we have other sources to get more money to continue subsidizing once we reach that that point where those funds run run dry. I uh, appreciate the question. Um, we have grown into uh, <clears throat> the amount of money that's being appropriated through T-CHIP. I know that uh, last fiscal year when we went from 
um, almost $800,000 to $1.5 million. Uh, that allowed for quite a bit of growth in the program. Uh, whenever we come into a fiscal year with the vendors, they all sign contracts. So we, as an as order of business, we try to look at what their going to capacity is, talk with them, discuss that with them, and try to give them the necessary funds immediately to be able to buy those CARP um, through their program. So uh, we set that money up immediately for them and where we don't, where we don't have an issue with not being able to have a payout. Um, the um, the, the 7.6 million pounds were all subsidized. I know we have a few more uh, carp that were harvested in the state, and you, you may notice that if you look at our commercial fishing uh, report. We do have more carp being harvested, uh, but just within the incentive program, that is all incentivized. Okay. And we do hope to make another increase moving forward, uh, and we hope to add a few more fishermen. Uh, but again, conditions uh, from year to year may not necessarily allow that. We have a flooding condition that could take away a couple of months of harvest, uh, cold weather. We've recently had that to happen to us. So uh, it's hard to anticipate how much growth is going to necessarily go from year to year. Um, but we've had steady growth. So I don't think currently we're going to, you know, be um, have an issue with funding. Uh, but if we did, of course, we would try to make every effort to to uh, make sure that didn't happen. Mr. Butler, you recognized. Just one comment on that. Um, <clears throat> we, we learned uh, yesterday that uh, Senator Shelby's replacement in Alabama did get his seat on Senate appropriations. And so our intent uh, at the Federation, working with partners, working with MICRA, is uh, there's going to be a fly-in day coming up to go to D.C. to uh, make sure this is the fourth year we've been able to keep the plus up on the federal funds. I want to put it in perspective, though, in terms of where we could be. Uh, the Brandon, Lode, Brandon Road project up north just got almost a billion dollar appropriation. We're playing with peanuts right now, peanuts. Yep. And uh, given that these funds are available for all of the Mississippi River Basin states, we need to go big and we need to do it pretty quickly. And that includes you know, I know uh, Travis and his team got about 300000 I think, to start the project design and engineering, thinking around some of the barriers. Um, but it's going to take a concerted effort uh, across multiple states. Um, and anybody that wants to get on the, uh, the little quarterly call that we do to help do that, we're, we're committed to, to – I want to see this at $100 million in the next two or three years. And, and that's the only way we're going to get to scale throughout the southeast region at least to start dealing with these problems because it's expensive. And, um, and I'm, I'm happy to see that there's, uh, you know, markets being developed around it to help carry some of that. But uh, these, these, these barrier projects are gonna be expensive and we've got to, we've got to keep the pressure up. Yeah. Any further questions? Um, uh, Mr. Thurman, and I don't know, this may be for you, maybe one of the other two, and just a uh, quick question about uh, biology. Uh, at what, age do the carp reach sexual maturity and about how long do they live who's that a question for i'm gonna have to pass that on to one of our subject matter experts okay here. all right uh we see the carp grow very fast um and they reach sexual maturity two to three years old um and then typically um you know, it's hard to pinpoint an exact uh, maximum age that, that might have been seen out there, but we expect about 12, 12 to 15-year range would be kind of a, close okay. to a max. All right. All right. Thank you. Well, and I appreciate you all being here to present to the commission today. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Next on our agenda, we have the U.S. Corps of our Army or U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Travis Wiley. Of course, he's a member member up here. So, Travis, we'll just uh, turn to you and let you make your presentation from up here. Yeah, I'll, I'll, if I start asking myself questions at the end, you guys just disregard. We'll stop you. I do All that right. sometimes. Yeah. Um, do I need the clicker? Can somebody? <clears throat> and, Travis, again, just for, for anybody who may be watching and trying to keep up, give us your name again, who you're with for the record. Travis Wiley, I'm a biologist with the Army Corps of Engineers who is in charge of the Section 509 uh, WERDA program. Okay, thank um, you. So I'm sort of owner of the environmental assessment effort, um, which I'll talk about in my slides. Um, as most of you know, and some of you may be new, but 
uh, the Water Resources Development Act, which we refer to as WERDA, in, uh, in, section, in year 2020 had Section 509, which was uh, entitled uh, Asian Carp Prevention Pilot Program. Um, geographically, the legislation was limited to the Cumberland and Tennessee Rivers. Um, Corps of Engineers is the owner, and what it directed us to do was, in conjunction with TVA and other federal agencies, to, uh, to start a pilot program uh, that would manage, carry out management and prevention of uh, carp populations on the Tennessee and Cumberland River. Um, word of 2022, um, the recently passed, was included the Tennessee Tom Bigby watershed with that. So the geographic scope expanded um, under this most recent word of from what it was initially in 2020. Um, the langu language was also included that no less than one project, um, it, it, it first of all, it authorized 10 projects in total and, and said no, no fewer than one shall be um, on the Tennessee Tom Bigby watershed. So sort of prescriptive in that it told us that in considering this um, larger scope that at least one project had to be on the 10 Tom. Um, so construction costs, 75% um, federal, uh, can't be more than 75% federal, which um, would include 25% for a non-federal sponsor. Um, and the O&M share, so um, if, if barriers are installed, then the O&M operation and maintenance of those structures and features would be 100% federal. Um, the the non-federal sponsors, such as states or not-for-profits, et cetera, would not own any of the O&M. Um, one, one other thing it required was an MOA for TVA for projects that may be on the Tennessee River. Um, how would, who would be responsible for what as far as O&M on those projects? And um, as previously referenced, 25 million was authorized under word of 2020. That did not change under word of 2022. It doesn't like me. Okay, thank you, Cole. Uh, these two maps um, show the, the geographic scope, whereas before the, the top two, the Cumberland, Tennessee watersheds uh, were included. And then when the Tennessee Tom Bigby was added in 2022, as you can see, takes in a lot, much larger scope on the um, Mississippi and Alabama, a whole, whole nother, uh, whole nother region, a whole nother district and, and division for us. And so we're currently working to try to integrate um, the personnel, the state agencies, um, et cetera, for those regions as well. Um, and so the Tennessee Cumberland River watershed is on the right. Um, our scope would include four potential sites on the Cumberland River. These are the main stem projects and main stem dam and lock structures. Um, Barkley, working from downstream to up, Barkley, Cheatham, Old Hickory, and Cordell Hull at the far upper end. Tennessee River is a little more complex, nine sites. Um, and so um, right now, uh, what we're focusing on on the, the Tin Tom is, uh, with what we know of the populations, is the Bay Springs Reservoir and that lock and dam structure. So those are the, the specific sites um, that our effort is looking at right now. Um, and, you know, we, as Cole, Cole's presentation referenced, the largest concentration of carp is, on the, is in the lower reach of the rivers, with the upper reach is not as affected. Next slide. So this is a, a little diagram to sort of show um, how our efforts are right now structured. Uh, as Mr. Butler referenced, we were, um, we were given $300,000 last year in the August timeframe to start um, looking at implementation of Word of Section 509. Um, and so all these things sort of tie together. So previously um, in 2021, Tennessee Valley Authority had done a programmatic environmental assessment. Federal agencies are always required um, for any action to under, under NEPA, National uh, Environmental Policy Act, to assess um, effects to the environment for any action they carry out. So what we're doing now is starting a programmatic environmental assessment to, to serve our NEPA obligations. What that will do is sort of identify the problem, which we know from the word of section 509, um, 
take a, a, a project purpose and then look at the best alternatives to meet that project purpose and consider the environmental effects. So environmental effects aren't just limited to um, fish, aquatic resources, uh, endangered species, but also consider things like um, recreation, safety, um, socioeconomics, and things of that nature. So we are, uh, as required by, by the WERDA, um, we're coordinating with uh, federal and state agencies um, to, to, to sort of find, the, um, as, as they have most of the data um, on carp populations. Um, so we're sort of collaborating to try to find the best solution as far as uh, barrier location. You know, what, where on the river system, now that the geographic scope has been expanded, um, where, where are the best sites that would really um, help us serve to control these populations? So, in addition to the programmatic EA effort, once we have a better feel and understanding for uh, the what, when, and, and where, um, we, we also have a programmatic management plan effort that will get into the finer details uh, once we figure out these things, construction schedules, design schedules, um, who would be a non-federal sponsor that would contribute that 25%, when would it be required, um, what would the roles be to get these things on the ground. Um, with that, once we have those details um, and, and work through the, the finer points of that, then we also have a cost share agreement um, that would be required for the non-federal sponsors um, that, would, that would contribute that 25%, um, but also for, for example, if, if a project is, is put down on the Tennessee River, we would be required to um, have an MOA with TVA to you know, clarify our uh, roles and obligations, cost sharing, et cetera, on the Tennessee River. So that's what we're doing with the 300,000 we've been given. Um, it's, it's, it's sort of a big effort, um, but we're making progress on it. Um, um, right now, just trying to get to the, the very foundation of the what, where, where and when, um, as far as barriers. Next slide, please. Um, what we're doing right now currently, as far as stakeholder engagement and coordination, we have um, bi-monthly meetings with TVA on, on a couple of levels. We have uh, fish and wildlife as a big player in these meetings. Um, and also USGS. So as part of the uh, TVA um, environmental assessment, there was a, there was a group that, that sort of analyzed the problem um, and, and said, here's what we know is, is all the state agencies, um, excuse me, the federal agencies as well that were stakeholders. And so they um, sort of collaborated with the data that they had and, and modeling efforts to determine um, which sites and what type of barriers would, would best solve the problem. Um, we've reached out to try to, to have a similar type of initiative um, with, with the things we know now, maybe, maybe any um, updates in, in population dynamics, um, things we know about um, you know, barrier effectiveness and also um, uh, the increased geographic scope. So that's, that's coming together um, later this spring um, on the state level, we've recently um, had calls with uh, fish and wildlife agencies to um, sort of uh, discuss specific requirements of 509 related to non-federal sponsors and also potential timing of our efforts. Um, so again, we can't go forward um, on projects, um, in anything past the planning part of it. Um, when it starts into design construction, we can't go forward without a non-federal sponsor. Um, and so right now we're trying to identify potential sponsors and work with them because obviously the location of, of barriers, um, the, the particular barrier type and the cost um, would, would sort of inform uh, their availability as a sponsor and, and what they could give. So um, locally we've also discuss uh, public or private stakeholders, not-for-profits, watershed groups, um, city and county governments, et cetera. Um, as part to, to start the NEPA process, um, on September 15th, we sent out a scoping letter that went to um, 
agencies, members of the public, and anybody that might sort of have a stake in this process. And we've we got a good response back. Roughly 159 parties responded, um, and so we're uh, we built those into our initial um, drafts of of the document um, as we continue to work with agencies and and are considering those as well. But that's that's sort of the status of the word of Section 509 effort, and I'll open it up for questions. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, questions for our presenter? Com Commissioner, Chairwoman Fox. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. <laughs> uh, Travis, is this uh, obviously this all this information is put together to help make decisions? Where I mean, this is the majority of the process. How to make the decision where the next deterrent will go? I mean, is this just part of the, large, for a large amount, this is how the process works or where the next deterrent will go? Right. And so for when you say next, you're considering the bath at Lake Barkley. So that, even the, the bioacoustic fish fence that's at Barkley, um, Fish and Wildlife is the owner of that. And um, after their pilot programs ends fairly soon, it will not have an owner. And so that's a consideration as well. Um, that existing barrier and what happens with it in the coming years. Also, um, the, the, other, um, the other locations on all three river systems. Yeah, it's, so it's, it's a requirement that we, we follow NEPA to, to, to make those, to consider environmental effects of those decisions and notify the public, and that's where we are. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, any further questions? Mr. Wiley. Well, Mr. Wiley, before we go to the, the next thing on the agenda, let me let me take myself back a few months when I was still in the legislature. I represented three counties on Chickamauga Lake. Mm -hmm. And so I heard from a number of constituents uh, on, on this issue, um, again, from a little bit different perspective at, the, at that time. Um, <clears throat> and whether I was a, a resident of Meigs County or a resident of, uh, I guess, Henry County uh, on, on Kentucky Lake, and um, I'm, I'm frustrated at the slow pace of, of this uh, process. Uh, again, not sitting up here and hearing all of this, it, you, you kind of understand why it's going slow. Sure. Does sure. The, the people who I represented who lived on Chickamauga Lake and Meigs County don't. Right. And, um, and so help me here with a little bit. First, I know we talked about an appropriation of, um, was it? Uh, 300,000. Yeah, 300 for us, but also um, looking at the, the, the possible up to 10 projects that could be on uh, on our system, and that there would be a 75 percent, there would be a 25 percent match from a non-federal source. Uh, what kind of money are we looking at? Like, if um, uh, you know, we wanted a, a barrier, be it at Chickamauga Dam or at uh, at Barkley. What what type of figure are we looking at? What type of uh, figure would the would the state or the non-federal uh, partner have to put in? Um, when are, and when are we going to be at that stage? Well, we're trying to, the, the environmental assessment process we looked at, we're trying to finish up by the end of the year. Um, and we're, we're working right now with, with, you know, affected stakeholders on the state, federal level to get the best information for that um, as far as the time frame. Um, obviously, at, at past that, it would take some time for design, construction, and and non-federal sponsors, um, depending on where the, the barriers were placed and what was, what was the first priority, they're going to need time probably, and I'm speaking for the states here probably um, out of turn, but they were, I'm, I'm sure there would be a process where they would need to uh, uh, work with their legislatures to, to get into a funding cycle. Um, so the, the estimates that, that, depending on the, the document, whether it be the TWRA document, um, TVA's environmental assessment, uh, et cetera, uh, for the, the, the BAF cost, the initial cost, for example, and, and there's some variance there as to whether uh, federal salaries were included or not, um, but it's somewhere in the six to eight million dollar range for that particular project. Um, so if you, if you figure 25 percent of that, you know, is, is roughly one and a half, two million. That was then. I'm sure you've seen in the news, inflation right. um, has has affected the, the the worth of a dollar between now and then, and so um, it's, it's a substantial amount of money. Okay. Um, 
you know, that's that's going to be in in our talks with state agencies. That's uh, that's that's going to be a uh, an issue. You okay. know, the, uh, state agencies are concerned about that as far as whether that money would be made available, um, and um, it's something that we're working through with them. So as soon as we know the um, when, where, and why, and when, where, and what we can we can sort of narrow that down a little bit. Um, as Mr. Butler referenced, although ten projects were were authorized, the twenty five million dollars when we talk about those construction costs and inflation since then don't really add up to ten projects right, um, right. from the construction in. O and M was not O and M was was not included in that. There was not a separate O and M um, um, authorization. So you know, then the federal agencies are looking at their O and M budgets too to to sort of determine what what can be afforded. So it's, it's a complex problem from that end as well. Okay, and and let me just ask one more question. Again, the, very similar to the questions I got at the Hardee's indicator in mm -hmm. Meigs County. So if if the state could just let's just say Tennessee decided to. Um, to appropriate $25 million and said, let's, let's put a barrier at Nickajack. Who does that? Who, do we do that? Does the state do that? We do, who so in that, puts so, that barrier there? So in that instance, if the state decided to make a, a, an initiative on their own, so that, right. would, that would be separate from the Section 509 Word of Funding. That, right. that would be sort of outside our legislation. So and th at that point, you would... Um, you would you would work with TVA and to to sort of uh, get a, get permission to put uh, a barrier at, at Nick okay. and then I'm assuming any barrier would have operating cost going sure. forward and and that would all have to be appropriated and taken care of at that time again I'm just sure. I, I know I'm asking questions that are kind of outside the scope of what you're talking about but these are things that I heard I'm sure these are things that representative Fritz hears as well so I'm trying to trying to voice those because you and I have been kind of in the same position before so I wanted to at least get us get that out there and be be talked right. about and it, yeah I know it's um you know I know with, with problems like this we you know we want it to be solved now um, right but uh, the reality is it takes funds to sort of go through the process the, the funds that have actually been given to the district to get started are, are very recent okay um, all right and so we're working working through the best we can but there are you know potentially there may be other sources of legislation in the future be it from the state or federal okay. level that um, would have their own timelines and sort of be outside our scope of section 509 all right Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, I guess we can go. If there's no further questions for Mr. Wiley. We'll go to the next thing on the agenda. It's TBA and Mr. DC. Mr. DC, you're recognized. Yes, I brought um, Mr. Clint Jones, and, and he's the uh, lead uh, for the uh, Tennessee Valley Authority Agency for Asian Carp. He has uh, Dennis Baxter. I think most of you knew Dennis. Uh, Clint has uh, replaced uh, Dennis as our lead for uh, Asian Carp. Clint, turn it over to you. Would make sure your mic is on, and then uh, I know he again said who who you are, but if you would please repeat your name and your position uh, before you start on your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, my name is Clint Jones. I'm a senior program manager, uh, dealing mainly with invasive aquatic species for the Tennessee Valley Authority. And it is a pleasure to talk to you today. I don't want to be redundant, but we are going to go over some of the same things that have been discussed already. But I do want to give you TVAs a brief update of what we're doing and where we're at right now with the Asian carp situation. So they've talked several times a day about some of the environmental review that TVA has already done. TVA did uh, do a programmatic environmental assessment. Um, and mainly it was talking about the, some of the barrier systems uh, for the Tennessee River or for the invasive carp. Invasive carp. Uh, the PEA and uh, findings of no significance, um, the FONSI, uh, was put out on December 15th, 2021. As you can see, it recommends six, basically seven locations. That's the main stem. Kentucky and Wilson, Kentucky's second lock will be done supposedly or we're working 
Hopefully, uh, due to supply chain issues, we were shooting for 2029. If y'all don't know, it's under con general construction right now. They're putting in a second lock. Uh, we are hoping that that works out. With, as y'all know, with the delays and everything, we do expect a little bit of delay on that. Um, Pickwick, Gunnersville, Nickajack, Chickamauga, and Watts Bar. So one thing I would be and obviously tell you is these are in no set where we're gonna be putting them at, just because number one is Chick uh, Kentucky and Wilson doesn't mean that's our top priority. TVA, when we did our programmatic uh, environmental assessment, looked at the situation and knew there was gonna be changes in technologies, dealing with some of our state and federal partners, we knew that there was gonna be opportunities to look at the communities before we put these in, in place. So a lot of people think when they see this uh, alignment, that's where we're exactly where we're gonna plan on putting them, but we're gonna work with the partnerships uh, that are available and, and do what's right for putting them in front of the Asian carp. So just wanted to put that out there for you. Also, uh, as y'all know, as a federal agency, we wanted to remind everybody that there are some different type, excuse me, there are some different uh, permitting that we have to do. And this is one of the things that um, to deal with the NEPA our environmental uh, compliance. Um, so we did want to go ahead and say, we know that there's going to be some other things that we're going to have to do out there besides working with the Corps of Engineers and other things to get our PEAs in place. Uh, we know that it will be a U.S. or Corps of Engineers Section 404 permit will be needed to put a bath system on a TVA facility. Clean Water Act 401 uh, certification or Tennessee ARAP permit will be required for that. Uh, you're looking at 12 months for both of those, uh, and that can run consecutively if we have to do both of those. Uh, air permits will be around 60 days. Um, all of these, like I said, can run consecutive. We also know that there'll be a stormwater construction general permit that we'll have to do before we you know, walk through the permitting process. Uh, that'll take around 90 days. And then potential is NHPA, National Historic Preservation Act uh, compliance, and that could uh, be somewhere around six months to get that in place and compliant. And that also will depend on the state that we decide if this barrier is in Alabama, depending on where it's at, Tennessee. That could also change that uh, schedule a little bit, but not much. Um, obviously, depending on the permitting, also will depend on um, the system that you want to install. You know, something's is not is less invasive and not going to be sitting you know in the way of the barge systems traffic and everything else it could change these durations just a little bit but they will still be required um, it just may not take as long and last but not least i wanted to like i said go through these pretty quickly for you but um here's some of the current efforts tva is doing we have been uh, really involved with micra uh, and the ten you know, Tennessee, all of our Al uh, Alabama, Kentucky, all of our states that we're dealing with with our fisheries work, we're uh, very involved with everything they do uh, and, and the federal, uh, other federal partners out there. And we really are uh, appreciative of the efforts that they've been uh, doing. We hopefully have been assisting that too, but we do have several things coming up, tagging uh, on the Cumberland and, or, Cumberland River there at Cheatham Reservoir, and also we're going to be tagging uh, for Tennessee River at Pickwick Reservoir. We're working with the state of Kentucky right now. We may be helping them out in USGS to do some extra tagging up there with them, uh, depending on what we hear back from them. Could you tell us just quickly the purpose of the tagging? Sure. The tagging is to let us know where the leading edge of the carp are. What we're doing is putting out, um, and Cole may actually know more of the numbers but uh, i think we put 200 on cheatham last year somewhere around there and about 160 tags on um in pickwick and basically that lets us know we have certain transmitters on the dams or when they come swimming by will let us know where they're at where the leading edge of these carp are going uh hopefully in the future it'll, it'll lead us down that path of where would be the best place to corral these fish use them you know but it also lets them know time date where they're going to be at and that's that's the reason for that um, Clint, what's the uh, target? Was it 600 fish for tagging? Uh, Kentucky was 
tagged 600 fish. Um, some of those were not. They, they tagged some of their native fish also to find out if they were getting displaced by some of the Asian carp also. But they, were, they tagged uh, buffalo, uh, paddlefish, drum, and I think they had a, a sturgeon or two in there maybe that they had tagged. So it's an ongoing process. It's one of the micro partnerships, you know, activities we're doing, hopefully get together more information about when these things are coming through the lock, how they're using the area. Uh, and we think we can put those together and, and help make better biological decisions on what to do when in the future. Also, um, like I said, on the Tennessee River, we're, we're always partnering with TWRA uh, to do surveillance for invasive carp. We also work with, you know, as, as Travis said, we've been working with the Corps of Engineer and we appreciate them working, including us, to help with the PEA. We're looking at ways we can help do that, maybe through the flu egg model, maybe through other different um, ways that we did our programmatic agreement to make it easier to work together. Like he said earlier, we're also working uh, to develop that memorandum of agreement, MOA, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, get through that word of process and get us something in place of process where we can, when the money does come, we can easily get it spent. We're not going to be waiting for somebody to figure out how we're going to get these things paid. We can work it all out up front. That's the reason for that. Um, along with that, TVA does uh, have biological information through almost back to 1990 in that area for all of our reservoirs. So we are still doing valley-wide collections on fish and macroinvertebrates uh, that'll hopefully be useful data to determine if the Asian carp are having effects on Navis fish species. We can go and look uh, through their past years, uh, and that's one of the things we're working with the states now, just in infancy, to get that developed of how we can use that data more efficiently, since it is a long-term, 30-year-plus uh, amount of information. As you can imagine, it's a lot, but we are going still doing spring sport fish. We're also doing um, fall reservoir fisheries assemblage index for just to get the information that we need and looking for aging carp in, in new areas. Like I said, I think it takes all of us working together to be able to get that information um, proactively. One of the things I did here is in TVA's also, it's not on here, but we've been very involved with, we've gone to several bass events. We had nine last year, I think, public events. We went to Hydrofest. We carry a one of our big tanks to put out there to show some of the native fish in the region, but it also helps us get the right biological information out to the public about silver carp uh, and a lot of the things that they're going on with them. And so we've, we're working, I know with TWRA coming up uh, for Bassmasters Classic, we're gonna be sitting there. You'll probably see our 800 gallon um, booth and that's to bring people in so we can actually talk and have good conversations with people We've talked to some of the land and lake uh, owners, user groups, and we also have talked to several other people, you know, trying to get the right information out there uh, for, for all of us in the partnership. And that's all I had to cover real quickly. Bob, did you have something else? Uh, yes. Um, you know, first of all, TVA is, uh, we're fully committed to uh, supporting all the agencies that are out there. I would like to uh, compliment uh, TWRA. They have put a lot of effort into uh, Asian carp, and we really do enjoy working with TWRA. Um, TVA has invested a lot of time, money, resources into Asian carp. We're a self-funded agency. We do not receive appropriations from Congress. Sometimes that's a misnomer out there. I want to make that point. Um, we're going to continue to support in a very important role here. We recognize support is important. We're going to continue to provide grants, whether it's to Kentucky or Tennessee. We're going to continue to do our surveys uh, in the spring and the summer. Uh, we're going to, as Clint just mentioned, we're going to continue to support the Bassmasters uh, programs that are out there. We have a lot of, I can probably name 13 other actions that we have that are going on right now, but I'm not going to, for the purpose of time, I'm not going to go through it. But I just want to let you know TVA's uh, full, full commitment, and we're going to work closely with TWRA to do what we can here to yeah. prevent this uh, Asian carp invasion that we're having. And, we, and, and I'll tell you, we appreciate that, um, uh, not only as a citizen of the state of Tennessee, but also 
um, um, now with the wildlife agency, both the cooperation that we get from TVA and the Corps on this. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you for your presentation, and uh, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda. Mr. Butler, I'll turn to you for an introduction of our next uh, presentation. Um, a while back, come on up. A while back, uh, we were made aware of a new company that has been founded in Tennessee, and um, uh, the name of that company is Carp Group USA, and they mm -hmm. are looking to open operations here. And uh, uh, from the very beginning, our philosophy has uh, been to try to remove as many of these fish from the water as we can possibly get done, which takes money, and that's where our focus has been to this point. But it, I thought it makes sense to have uh, the, the commission hear from one of the principals in Carp Group USA so they can share kind of where they have evolved to from where they started into a, this, a bigger idea. I think you're going to find it interesting. It is definitely something that represents taking some of the concepts that we have seen uh, work successfully to a whole different level of scale. And um, it, it is going to present some challenges, I think, uh, on the funding side, which we're committed to helping uh, through our work in Washington and here in, in town. But with that, I want to uh, recognize Baron Huber, who is, I don't know what his official title is. He's kind of a, a doer of all things, kind of. Uh, but um, Baron, if you would, uh, I'll hand the floor over to you and let you kind of educate us on Carp Group USA, what it is and what you're wanting to do. I don't think your mic's on. Try that red light on? We're on now. There I you go. There you go. Thank you, Mike. Um, uh, my name is Baron Huber. I'm a principal in the Carp Group USA, which is a Tennessee company. Uh, the Carp Group USA is a convergence of three separate companies uh, that have come together to, to form uh, the said entity. Uh, some of you may may know me or recognize me. I've, I've been in, in these uh, meetings before. I'm, I'm Originally from East Tennessee, I'm Knoxville born and raised. Uh, I, I did attend uh, the University of Alabama and, and graduated there, so I feel remiss uh, if on a public Your time scale. Can we then go on to something? <laughs> I do feel remiss on a public scale if I don't surrender my sword um, and and wish congratulations to the volunteers on the uh, on the task force and here in attendance and those watching. So con congratulations! But uh, no, we really sincerely appreciate the opportunity to explain ourselves, who we are, and and the opportunity that we create. Um, specifically, I want to thank TWRA uh, for, for their previous work historically, as you've seen today, what they've been instrumental in doing. Uh, and, and this is a, a problem solved over perhaps the grandest of scales. There's a ton of variables that go into helping solve a solution. Certainly, I don't think there's a silver bullet. I think it's a conglomerate of many ideas and conglomerate of of uh, many avenues that, that reach a, a solution. Uh, and, and what Eric and Cole have done, particularly with T-CHIP, I work with many states uh, that have similar programs. I can say by far and away, the state of Tennessee is light years ahead of others. Uh, and, and that work has been tremendous. And, and we really appreciate, to this point, TWRA's accessibility uh, just to talk uh, about CARP where the, and where the future is, in particular Mark Thurman, who's whose uh, new position, he's been extremely accessible. And, uh, and we, we, we certainly appreciate that. I'd also like to rec uh, recognize the Department of Ag uh, for their, um, in particular, Commissioner Hatcher and Assistant Commissioner Andy Holt, uh, for their time, effort, and energy uh, in, in helping us find solutions in the ag space specifically uh, uh, for CARP. Uh, I'd also like to recognize my team members that are here with me today. Uh, I have Jeff Young, uh, which is a part of uh, Advanced Marine Technologies out of New Bedford, Massachusetts. Uh, my my business partner, Mike Salicki, uh, in m and Fish Company, which is out of uh, the state of Maine. Unable to attend today is Eugene Raffield, who's, I'm sure, cozy in Port St. Joe, Florida, <laughs> dodging the ice uh, with Raffield Fisheries. So um, we appreciate that. And, and let me just take a second here and sort of reset myself. Uh, like I said, I know I've been visible in, in this setting before. Uh, and, and just kind of to, to transition to what, what I want to be the main thrust of conversation. Uh, my partner and I, Mike Salicki, uh, have been in the, the, the carp industry for going on four years now. Uh, we were instrumental in developing markets for bait. 
uh, particularly in the state of Maine, which is where uh, our original business was was capitalized in Maine. Uh, we quickly grew other markets, uh, Maine obviously with lobster, uh, the state of Florida and the Keys area with um, uh, stone crab, uh, and then in Louisiana with blue crab uh, and crawfish. And as business naturally evolves, uh, along the way, we, we, we did run into to Jeff Young, quite, quite literally, uh, through Eugene Raffield. And uh, Jeff explained what, what, his, what AMT was, was able to do and what his business is. And um, you know, we were able to get Jeff Carp uh, and, and try uh, Carp as a, as a um, non-petrochemical nitrogen fertilizer. Uh, and that's why we're here today, is to specifically discuss our capability in, in doing such. Uh, the experience of the CARP Group USA, uh, we have over 40 years experience specifically in conducting invasive species removal in the state of Florida out of Lake Apopka and Lake George uh, for gizzard shad. Uh, there's a combined over 75 years of plant experience and plant operations and processing. Uh, there's 29 years of business uh, specifically in fertilizer production and with liquid fertilizer, and currently uh, the number one producer of liquid fish fertilizer uh, in the United States. Uh, I think the opportunity that we have um, to bring to the state of Tennessee uh, is, is multifaceted. I think first and foremost, just on the most simple scale, uh, in order for us to operate, we need raw material. We need fish. Uh, the, the nature of this operation is conducive to large-scale removal. To give you an idea, 10 pounds of fish roughly makes one gallon of fertilizer. So in this state, uh, the addressable market for fertilizer made from our carp uh, would be 250 million pounds if we put a gallon of fertilizer to cover our, our, our ag industry just here in Tennessee. That would be on a yearly basis. Uh, certainly, I'm not suggesting that we're going to remove 250 million pounds a year. Let me let me be very clear about that. Uh, but to give you an idea of the scalability and the capability that we have right here in our back door, this isn't something that has to be thought of and grown. Um, I, I think we offer a unique um, idea of stability for the the future of of the CARP program. Uh, from the standpoint of working with current buyers that were mentioned here today uh, to be able to have uh, market options to sell fish, uh, to work with fishermen, uh, to have an in-state outlet uh, that currently depends heavily upon Kentucky to be able to provide a market for us to, to move fish. An overwhelming majority of our fish in this state go to Kentucky uh, to be sold in markets there. I think that we have the ability uh, to, to be more efficient and stand alone here in our state where we can control the ability uh, of, of market potential, uh, where we don't have to turn away buyers and don't have to turn away uh, fishermen. In doing so, the nature of this business, uh, with it being fertilizer, um, creating input independence for our state, for our farmers and our growers, uh, is something that currently is, is exposed to global risk of production. Most of our petrochemical fertilizer comes from overseas. Uh, we have the ability through, through our products to, to stand up an outlet uh, here in our state, utilizing CARP, uh, to, to be able to, to move towards an independence uh, from petrochemical fertilizer and move towards uh, an independence uh, for inputs for our growers, which uh, would include um, uh, a candidly a, a savings um, because it's coming from in state. Uh, it's a chance to to help our growers um, not only work more efficiently, uh, but to to operate their business. Um, with, with bottom line in mind. And in doing this, uh, the ability that we have to create a regenerative ag industry here in Tennessee that solves major issues, not just here, uh, but across the country, such as nutrient leaching, 
uh, soil erosion, and overuse of petrochemical nitrogen fertilizer. Uh, through our expertise and what we have done, the studies that we have over 29 years of experience, uh, we have the ability uh, to bring a regenerative ag movement here in this state and certainly uh, outfit uh, our growers and farmers here, uh, but also as economies of scale, perhaps further in, and across the country and certainly in our region. And finally, I, I, I think the opportunity that, that is interesting to realize is with our capability uh, and hopeful infrastructure here in this state, I think we can be used to recruit more of these federal dollars to our state to help solve this issue, whether it be barriers, whether it be understanding uh, the migration, whether it be uh, helping funding um, programs such as T-CHIP. Uh, I think that we give the state the ability to stand sure-footed, both two feet, uh, and go to Washington and, and request more of those dollars to come to our state. And uh, I think that's a, I, I, I think we would make a great partner in doing that. It's a, certainly a great story and it's much needed. Uh, and I, I think we would, uh, we would both share reciprocity uh, in doing so. So I was told at one point early in my life that brevity was the soul of wit. So I'm going to, I'm going to get out as, as quick as I can, but um, w we do appreciate the time. Um, we look forward to working with the the agencies, not only TWRA and Department of Ag, as I mentioned here, but certainly tourism and, and ECD and, and whomever else is interested in, in hearing more about our story. Uh, we certainly appreciate the time. And, um, you know, we look forward to being here in the state of Tennessee, helping sustain uh, a commercial industry, hopefully creating, in, uh, creating input independence, spur a regenerative ag movement, and create rural job opportunities that remove lots and lots of fish. So with that, I'll step aside and I'm more than willing to uh, answer any questions that anybody may have. Thank you, Mr. Schieber. Any questions for our presenter? CNN, we appreciate you being here today. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Before we bring this meeting to a close, are there any remarks or uh, any other comments that any of the commission members would like to make? Mr. Tumlin, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Last week, your mic, I, oh, your mic is on. I'm sorry. I think I'm, yeah, I got yeah, I got on. a red light. Yep. Last week, I had the privilege to to attend the Tennessee Riverline Annual Conference down. Unfortunately, it was in Gunnersville, Alabama, and, and we're working hard to get it back in Tennessee next year to get those dollars. But you know, I'm, I sat down there and I spoke to a guy named Norm McGowan. Recently purchased Air, Arrowhead Marina on Watts Bar Lake, up in up in your neck of the woods, and. Norm, just like your guy at Hardy's, was, was concerned. He's putting millions of dollars into Arrowhead. Uh, there depends upon the recreation there in, in East Tennessee. And, and to, to, to Norm, he asked, what can we do to move this thing, this ball down the court? And so I appreciate everybody's report today. You know, my urgence is how do we move it down the court? You know, what resource can, can this board be? How do we help you navigate and break down barriers so that Norm's couple of million dollars is not at risk uh, with process? I look at Chickamauga Dam. I get to cross it pretty regular, and it's a big lock project is going on. To me, the, the common guy, I believe it's a perfect chance to put in something because you got the lock completely wide open down to the ground. Kentucky Lake's the same way. There's a big lock project happening there. I almost think there's some common sense things that make sense and we need to get out um, in front of. But anyway, um, how do we break those log jams? I'm a doer and uh, I would like to be a resource to you guys that, that need log jams opened up. That's all I got to say, sir. Thank you. Any further comments? We'll see none and it will be, it will not be as long until the next meeting uh, that we call for this commission. In fact, uh, it just go ahead and um, kind of put it in the back of your head. We'll probably meet sometime in July or August. Uh, we'll get an update. I know we've got, um, um, we're going to be getting a report on what within the next month, I think, on the on the bath system. And uh, we'll get together. It may be a much shorter meeting than this one, but we'll get together again in about six months. And so you'll hear from me. And I appreciate everybody taking the time out to be here today. Uh, some of you came from several hours away and, uh, we appreciate it.
So without any further business to come for us, we're adjourned. <laughs>